Hello friends, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday afternoon from 1 to 1.30 p.m. I'm your host, Danilo Cuellar, and today we'll be discussing why government schools are prisons for the young. This is from my blog post by the same name. I do sincerely believe we were all born voluntarists regarding lack of recognition of authoritarian overlords and with innate knowledge of the non-aggression principle, self-ownership, and property rights. This is demonstrated by the frequent toddler expressions of, quote, it's mine, you said, and it's not fair. These imply deep understandings of verbal voluntary contractual agreements and property rights. These simple yet vitally important concepts are routed out by us, are routed out of us by 12 years of forced attendance at the quote government indoctrination camps, known as public schools. They are replaced with state virtues such as obedience, rote memorization, nationalism, and conformity. <clears throat> the principles of voluntarism are consist inconsistent with a life of, quote, government worship. Quote, government schools are prisons for the young. They are the institutions wherein, gov wherein children must attend against their will and are incessantly force-fed government propaganda without respite. Would you force anyone to learn what you thought is necessary for them to learn just because you were in a position of authority and call that education? Would you truly say you, quote, learn something if someone forced you to memorize it and then regurgitate it on a test as proof of your, quote, education? These actions seem more akin to indoctrination rather than education, tyranny rather than freedom. Some aspects that are shared between prisons and, quote, government schools are forced attendance, use of bells to signal movement, existence of clearly defined authority figures and subjects, specifically designed times and areas for, quote, recess, conflict resolution only encouraged with the authority figure rather than amongst the peers, creation of bullies and gangs, no freedom of association, no freedom of speech, no freedom of private property, no privacy, and an overwhelming clock-watching desire for freedom. Some unspoken lessons taught to students in government schools are truth is arbitrarily doled out by authority, Intelligence results from rote memorization of facts and figures. Conformity is the ideal. Obedience is rewarded and disobedience is strictly reprimanded. <clears throat> Does this sound like an institution whose objective is education, socialization, creative thought, critical analysis, and deductive reasoning? If you are a parent, be honest with yourself. Did you enjoy your 12 government school years? Did you learn a great deal of useful information that you now apply to your life? Did you learn any skills that have made you eligible for anything other than a minimum wage job at a fast food franchise? By the way, I'm not bashing fast food jobs since for many low-skilled people, they provide the foot in door job experience that is required to be eligible for higher paid jobs. It's just that if you spend 12 years of dedicated full-time effort to any subject, I would expect you to be supremely skilled in that field or in multiple fields, which would put your labor value far above minimum wage. If you answered no to any of the aforementioned questions, then how could you possibly want a similar subpar, mundane, and spiritually damaging experience for your precious little ones? 
I end with a quote by H.L. Mencken, American journalist and essayist. The aim of public education is not to spread enlightenment at all. It is simply to reduce as many individuals as possible to the same safe level, to breed and train a standardized citizenry, to put down dissent and originality. That is its aim in the United States. Whatever the pretensions of politicians, pedagogues, and other such mount bank banks, <laughs> and that is its aim everywhere else. So, public education or government schools, as it should more accurately be called, since um, that is exactly what is paying for it and that is exactly what the people that graduate from it most often support. And I don't really think that's an accident. I don't think that um, the fact that the military um, aggressively try to um, ensnare the, uh, the students right before they graduate um, to join the military because um, that's the perfect time, you know, right before they get out into the real world and see things for what they are, they can make their own decisions, they are immediately um, caught up in the, uh, in the whole, you know, war on terror, war on drugs, war on whatever, uh, there's always a war going on. Um, and the um, and once you go into the military, the indoctrination continues nonstop. It's nonstop. So when does this all begin? Um, so the concept of public education, of course, did not always um, exist in the United States. Um, it started, I believe, around the 1850s, 1840s, um, when. Um, I think it was an American politician, went overseas um, and was examining some of the um, schooling styles in Europe and Prussia. And, um, and they noticed that um, in this one region of Prussia, um, they had very efficient soldiers. And, uh, and the reason they did was as a result of their um, government schooling, right? So public education... You know, everybody gets taught the same thing, you know, one size fits all type thing. So, so students were not really given the freedom to learn what they want, to, you know, to be taught by their parents at home, um, which would confer, which would necessarily confer a more individualized and thorough education, all right, that caters to the individual <laughs> rather than catering to like, you know, thousands of students at once. So, um, so they noticed that in Prussia, the soldiers were extremely obedient and um, mindless, <laughs> which is synonymous. Um, and so they made, they made very effective soldiers and, so, uh, and, and, and citizenry, uh, obedient citizenry in general. So, so he came back to America and they basically adopted, I think it was in Massachusetts, uh, was the first public school. And it was, uh, of course, it was uh, resisted um, by the local people. But uh, over time, you know, through um, the passage of various laws and, you know, the Department of Education and uh, board, or the Board of Education and all that kind of stuff, um, it, it entered into the, um, you know, the government sphere of influence, right? So the, so the government basically, the federal government basically, decide, uh, you know, realized that if <clears throat> enlargement of their sphere of influence was their goal, and by the way, that is the goal of uh, most, if not all, governments is simply to enlarge, enlarge, and expand until you know this ex expansion produces a top-heavy scenario um, that can sustain itself no longer, and collapse happens because the productive middle class that is sustaining the whole expansion and growth cannot support the parasitic bureaucrats any longer, and either they stop working or they just, you know, they, um, the capacity of, uh, of those that are dependent on state or, or the bureaucrats, um, their parasitic influence robbing the productive middle class of their prosperity becomes too great and, and a collapse occurs. And then, you know, frequently new government appears, unfortunately, because people never learn a lesson, right? Um, so, 
so public education really, really got hold in the early 1900s. Uh, I believe it was David Rockefeller that uh, uh, assisted in the foundation of the first um, Department of Education. And, um, and, and so it just, it just basically grew from there. Um, and so they, and so, you know, the, the federal government realized that in order for it to continue to expand, right, you not only need taxation, uh, as funds for the federal government, um, but you also need, um, the belief that it's necessary. So the myth the belief in the myth of authority, right? The belief that some people have the right to rule over other people, right? Some people have the right to steal other people's property, right? Because um, this is what we're all basically taught, that, uh, you know, our property is not our own, our income is not our own, right? Um, you must give your fair share, you must, you know... Um, <laughs> um, you know, to assist in uh, the growth of society, right? Like, so, like, we, ha we all have a debt to society, which is complete garbage, of course, right? Because um, society really doesn't exist. Only people exist, all right? This is something that we all have to understand, is that, um, you know, we talk about countries, we talk about, you know, minorities and majorities and groups of people, Democrats, Republicans, when in fact the reality is that these groups don't exist, okay? They, they're just arbitrary collective entities that we have fabricated. We call this a name, you know, the black population, the de Democrats, right? The gay population, whatever population. But how can you realistically um, reduce people into, you know, a given category when they all have their, you know, individualistic wants, needs, and desires, you know? You really cannot do that without destroying some individual sovereignty, right? Individuality. So this this is what's necessary to occur when you submit a population to public education, right? This is this is why public education is so necessary, so important. And if you look back in history at the at the empires that were so so totalitarian, you know, with the, with a very powerful central government. Um, central authoritarian structure, you will notice that education is of prime importance. Public education, not education, not public education is of prime importance. Actually, when you take, take apart the, uh, the phrase public education, it's actually a, uh, an oxymoron, right? Because uh, we all know that um, education, well, we, we, we all kind of intuitively understand that education does not necessarily happen only in the classroom, and I would actually assert that <laughs> it doesn't happen at all in the classroom, right? But I'll say not mo not all in the classroom, right? So most, if not all, of education primarily happens um, through your creativity, right? Through uh, your experiences, through meeting new people, through talking to people, through you know your passions, what you you know the things that you're most um, interested in following. That is what you're going to pick up, right? That is what you're going to learn. And that's what's going to stay with you, right? How often do you, uh, you know, for a class, you, you study, 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 and, um, <laughs> and you memorize all the facts and figures for the test, but of course, um, after that, it just falls out of your brain, and it's, and it's completely gone and useless. And, and so what's the purpose of that? You know, what, what, is, what is really the purpose of public education if, if it's not giving us um, knowledge that's useful or important in our lives, right? Um, <clears throat> Because if 12 years of education or indoctrination um, was really useful, we would, I would assume, like I said, we would most likely be more valuable after we graduate than a minimum wage job, right? But we're not. That's what most kids are, that's, that's their entire value is a minimum wage job. And that's very depressing because, like I said, if you, if you were to take 12 years and devoted to anything, anything, you would be a master at it, right? Or multiple things, you know, you would be a master at it. So, um, it's completely illogical to think that, um, you know, 12 years of public education produces anything of value at all, you know, at all. Um, and not only that, but I, I was, uh, 
I just saw a, um, a TED talk of an Indian guy, um, uh, Mitra, I think his name was last name, um, and, he, and he did a talk on um, <clears throat> spontaneous emergence of learning, of education without teachers, right, without, um, without authority figures. And, and he discovered that in the most remote areas of the world, you know, India, Cambodia, you know, let's say ghettos and slums around, you know, inner cities, um, people, uh, kids, um, learn amazingly well when nobody's around, right? So he did this experiment where he put, you know, computers in an area of, uh, you know, inner city kids who were illiterate, did not know English, right? And you would just give them uh, free reign to a computer <clears throat> and they would, you know, they never saw a computer in their lives, never saw internet in their lives. And all of a sudden he comes back um, like a week later and he discovers, he discovers that they not only can navigate and browse the internet, but they learn English and they learn, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they learn uh, information that they found was valuable, right? Um, and so you see this, this over and over again that, you know, kids, once they're given the time to pursue things that they're actually interested in, will learn, will most definitely learn. You know, we, we have this idea every time I, I tell my kids, I have two kids, I have a, a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and uh, of course they will not go anywhere near a public education institution. Um, but when I tell people that, you know, some people say, well, why? I mean, you, how are they going to learn how to read? <laughs> and to which my answer would be how did you learn how to speak okay so we learn how to speak not because we sat in a class and somebody taught us how to speak right we learn how to speak because we grew up with people speaking right and and then we just adapted, right? The, the, human, the human condition is just amazingly adaptable and, uh, you know, can mold itself to various circumstances that are necessary, right? So, uh, you know, a child in, uh, in Ireland grows up with, with an Irish accent. A child in, in, uh, in the Amish country becomes, you know, a, 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 an, Amish, an Amish person, right? So, so in whatever situation children are born in, they will adapt, they will learn, right? So, you know, you talk a specific language with a specific accent, that's the language and accent that they will grow up in, right? Surprise. Um, so why is everything else considered different? Why is math considered different? Why is learning about history considered different? Why is learning to read considered different? It shouldn't be, right? It, this is all like, um, you know, that you, you, th they learn by doing, right? By mimicry, right? So this is why, you know, it's so important if you want to, teach your child something, you should do it yourself. <laughs> you know, do as I say, not as I do. It does not really, um, uh, it's not really too effective as a parent parental strategy. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so there's really nothing that is exempted from this ability of learning as you're doing, right? Active learning while doing or while observing. Um, so, so I always, you know, I, I always encourage families, you know, parents to um, allow their children to pursue whatever, uh, whatever field they want to, because you really never know what your child will become interested in. You can, you can give them a nudge in a certain way, but you don't really know where they're going to end up. <clears throat> you know, you, you, it's, it's completely unpredictable. And, um, and that's the beauty of it. You know, we're going to, Maybe they're going to develop some cure to some obscure disease. We have no idea, you know. The you know people when they're left, when they're left to their own devices, right? And they're left in freedom to do as they please. Beautiful things emerge. I have no doubt about that. Um, so, so in essence, what we're doing with kids when we force them to go to public school is we're saying that this is the world that I grew up in. It's going to be the exact same way when you graduate and you need to know the exact same things I do, which is, which is an enormous uh, 
amount of hubris to, to say to predict for anyone to predict the future, right? How can we? How can any of us predict the future, right? We barely know what's going to happen tomorrow or next week, so predicting years in advance is uh, entirely nonsensical. But that's what we're essentially saying. Well, when we force kids to go to public school, this is what I learned when I was young, and the world is exactly the same. Therefore, you have to learn the same thing, right? So, obviously, the world changes in immense ways, and um, <clears throat> kids have to adapt themselves to that. So, forcing kids to go and learn antiquated knowledge, outdated knowledge, is really, it, it's, it's, not only, um, <clears throat> it's not only a waste of time, but it's, it's spiritually destructive, and it, and it just annihilates their creativity, their passion for, for learning. You know, if you want to get somebody to, to hate reading, send them to public school. <laughs> it's, it's an almost ensured result that they will end up hating learning and most likely reading in general, right? So, <clears throat> so, so, so what they're doing, what you're actually doing is, you know, you're, because, you know, what would happen if a child was able to do whatever they want? If a child was able to learn whatever they want, right? What, what kinds of beautiful things could they discover, could they learn about and become adept and masterful at, right? We have no idea because once you force somebody to do something against their will for years and years and years, you have destroyed that potential. That is the classic window, broken window fallacy, right? Is the, the seen and the unseen, right? So people tell me, you know, when I tell them about this, they say, well, look at you. You went to public school and you turned out okay. <laughs> Which a, uh, is, I guess you could say is kind of true, but in the same sense you could say, you know, to somebody who just got raped and, you know, years later, let's say they, they made a successful business, you say, look at you, you got raped and you turned out okay. <laughs> so, does a person um, expelling all that intellectual excrement, um, does that justify the immorality of the coercion in the past? Of course not, right? The immorality is always there, right? It's like saying, you know, it's okay that, the, you know, the government taxes us and steals our money because we have roads or we have libraries or, uh, you know, we have whatever public structure, right? Or <laughs> pyramids, they pyramids in Egypt, right? Built by the slaves, right? <clears throat> How would we build the pyramids, right, if it wasn't for the slaves? So it's the age-old question of, uh, you know, this, that, that a, um, a supposed beneficial result now does not cancel out the immorality before, right? So, so we have to never forget the immorality of coercing somebody to do something against their will. It doesn't matter if they're doesn't matter if they're an adult or child, does not matter at all. People make this enormous exception. Oh, they're children, they have no idea what they're doing, they need to be led, they need to be directed, they have no idea about the world, we have to show them. Um, <clears throat> no, I'm sorry. Um, we are not experts at the world, okay? <laughs> and it would be enormous hubris to believe, to think that we need to show them anything, all right? The best the best a parent can do is to protect their child from harm and danger. That's it. You know, if the child wants to learn something out of their own natural curiosity, they'll ask us and we'll teach them. Okay? Or, most likely they'll learn on their own if they really want to learn. Right? They, you know, you say, a, um, a, saying is, a saying that I like is, if a child wants to learn, nothing will stop him. If a child doesn't want to learn, nothing will convince him. So, <clears throat> so to say that a child went through 12 years of public school and got this piece of paper called, called a diploma, we call it education, um, is pretty absurd because it doesn't prove anything. All, right? all it proves is that you can force somebody, a child, to do something against their will because you're stronger. Right, because you're an adult, and uh, and that proves nothing, nothing whatsoever. All it proves is that you're stronger, and might, as we know, does not make right, right? <laughs> um, because if it did, then wars would bring about peace, 
and of course they don't, right? As George Collins said, um, fighting a war for peace is like screwing for virginity. And the same can be said for expecting um, public education to yield poets, philosophers, theoretical phys physicists, you know, scientists. Um, <laughs> The fact is they don't, and no matter, it, it, it doesn't matter how much public education reform bills are passed, it doesn't matter how many, how many books are put into the, the libraries of the schools, if the kids don't want to be there, they're not going to get read, okay? If the kids don't want to, don't want to attend these classes, <clears throat> and you're still forcing them, all you're, all you're showing is that you can force people, is that you can force people to memorize information that you think is important that we think is relevant right and as history shows and the um you know the advent of various new technologies and inventions shows things rapidly become obsolete all right we have a limited amount of time on this planet okay we do not live infinitely all right so any time lost is a supreme tragedy supreme tragedy okay so just consider that when you send your kids to public school and they don't want to be there you're robbing them of their life okay you're robbing them of the potential that they can contribute to the society the potential of new wondrous and magnificent inventions that may very well improve our lives but that potential has been destroyed by your arrogance and hubris all right so we need to let go of this this myth that we're bigger we're smarter we know better we need to direct our kids kids are idiots they don't know any better okay believe me Genius is as common as dirt. And all we need to do to help the kids is to get out of their way. And once you do that, I believe you'll be amazed at the results. So, <laughs> when people tell me, look at you, you went to public school and you turned out okay. They say, well, yes, that may be true, but how might, might I have turned out had I not gone to public school, had I not been forced, had I been able to pursue my real passions, which were, you know, Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, chess, piano, astronomy, cosmology, theoretical physics. What would I have been able to do had I continued my study in those, devoted myself entirely to those? I have no idea. Because I have fallen into the the routine, you know, um, and that's okay. I recognize it. I can accept it, and hopefully, um, other people will not make the same mistake <clears throat> with their kids. I know I won't. So, I think I'll um, I'll end right there. Thank you for listening. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.